Hey there, Sharon Horton Nelson here. Welcome to day 1737 of What's She Up To Now? Documenting the journey originally as I transitioned from the brick and mortar corporate world of business to the online world. Following my divorce, I was like, I don't want to retire yet. I'm old enough, but I still have energy. I'm still curious about things in the world. What do I want to do? What have I always wanted to do? And ever since the beginning of the internet, I remember staying up all night, even though my kids were sleeping and I had to work in the morning, staying up all night playing on the internet and exploring because I was so fascinated by it. So I kind of kept that in the back burner for, geez, a, almost a couple of, a couple of decades, definitely a couple of decades. And just here and there, I would pop on and dabble. But for the most part, I didn't do anything online. I was fully ingrained in the offline world, running businesses and working in corporate America simultaneously throughout my entire corporate career. But <clears throat> in 2004, I said, okay, I'm done with corporate America. I think I got laid off when my company was sold and I'm like, yeah, I don't need to do this anymore. I'm going to just work in my businesses and build businesses. So that's what I did with myself and with my ex-husband. So today I now produce a couple of pieces of content every day. Number one, why do I show up every day For, to keep myself, hold myself accountable and to be consistent. Number two, to provide some value, some lessons learned, to share some things that I've learned so that you don't have to make all the same mistakes I did. You'll, you'll find plenty of mistakes to make. You don't need to do the same ones I've already done. So I like to share the lessons that I've learned along the way so that we don't have to make the same mistakes, all of us, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I used to be the queen of reinventing the wheel. So for my Super Size Your Business for Female Entrepreneurs group, we're talking about the idiom, keep one's options open. It's from about the 1630s, and it basically says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to refrain from making a decision about my future. I'm not going to commit to something because I want to keep my options open and I don't want to be limited to one possible solution in the future. What happens when we keep our options open? Everybody around us that's involved in something that they want to be involved in with us knows we're keeping our options open. <clears throat> and so they're not going to commit either. So you end up with a situation, especially in our businesses, where people are only tipping their toe in the water or trying. They might come to work for us, but they're only just going to give it a try. And as soon as it gets uncomfortable or they don't like something that someone says or something that happens, they're out of there, right? They're going to try something else. They're not committed. And we filter that out in the, in the interview process if we are smart and wise and we don't bring those elements into our business, right? We don't bring, we don't choose to have relationships that we dabble in or just tip our toe in the water about unless that's what we're looking for. If we just want to be casual and keep our options open, then we make sure everybody that we're doing that with knows that we're doing that, right? And then we have to let them keep their options open too, right? We can't expect different things and different behaviors from other people than we expect from ourselves if we're if we're in a relationship, et cetera. You know, friendships, intimate relationships, business relationships, et cetera. If we're going to keep our options open, guess what? So are the other people that we're involved with. Now, from a business standpoint, I didn't really talk about this in Super Size Your Business. I, as a business owner, had one primary supplier for everything that we use. I'm talking about in a manufacturing business because you have to have suppliers, right? People that get your raw materials and people that help you with distribution and sales, etc. So I would always deal with one primary source for that service or product. But, and this is a big but, but it's very important. We have to have contingency plans and backup plans because what if something happens to one of your main suppliers? And I will give an example of this. In my Italian food manufacturing business, we did business with one vendor in Wisconsin that uh, supplied a lot of our, our key ingredients. And one night he committed suicide and all of a sudden, the supply was cut off and we had, we didn't have any cheese, any eggs, any extra heavy whipping cream, any, uh, any of the core ingredients we needed for, well, we had a couple because we got them from someone else to manufacture our products. Well, luckily we had enough to carry us over a couple of days, which allowed me the chance to scramble and find other suppliers. And I always had suppliers and what was going on with them in my the back of my mind, but I wasn't dealing directly with them. It turns out that the one person and the one supplier that replaced all of those things for me 
was a supplier I already had a relationship with that was supplying just a couple of things for us. And I just switched immediately everything over and we didn't miss a beat. So I was committed to the relationship, but something can still happen to, to dissolve the relationship. Think of the COVID pandemic. How many of us were prepared for that? And how do we respond to it? And it, it, it's up to us to, to discuss that and know for ourselves. If you have not sat down and said, what are the lessons? And I'm talking with respect to business lessons, but how about life lessons? What are the lessons I learned from the pandemic? What did I learn about myself? What did I learn about other people? How can I use that information going forward? So if anything like this craziness ever happens again, I am better prepared. If you haven't done that, I suggest you sit down today and just start writing down a couple of things that you learned from the pandemic. I learned a ton about myself from the pandemic and what I do in situations where I feel like it's 100% out of my control versus what I want to do in situations where I feel like it's 100% outside of my control. Because I think for the vast majority of us, the way the pandemic was handled was like the weather, pretty much 100% outside of our control. We just had to figure out how we were going to respond to each of the different things that happened as they came down the pipe. So keeping our options open, I find this really an interesting idiom because I actually teach a tool that I call the 1031 brainstorming tool for giving ourselves more options. Because what I found in myself as well as in other people, we tend to believe and lock ourselves into based on our beliefs and past experiences that we only have a couple of options. It's either this or that. It's this or this or maybe a third option if we're really being open-minded. So as part of the annual challenge, I always push people. We're going through the SOAP framework right now. And we're on the O, and the O in SOAP framework stands for options. Yesterday we talked about our story. What's our current story? What's our desired story? Because that creates the gap between what we want and where we are right now. And we use the rest of the SOAP framework, the O, the A, and the P, to fill that gap. Well, we can't fill the gap until we start brainstorming or coming up with ideas of what we could possibly do to start filling that gap. And not the whole gap, but what's the next step? What's the next logical step? What's the next possible step we could take? And so really we're brainstorming 10 possible next steps, right? 10 possible ways of getting us moving toward filling that gap. And over time, we will fill that gap. I guarantee that if you decide that you want to go from here to here, you'll absolutely get there. If you want to go from here to here, I can't see my hand. You'll absolutely get there. But it's one step at a time. It, and, and once in a while, we get to make little quantum leaps. But for the most part, focus on what are 10 possible next steps. Why 10? Because we don't get into that black and white thinking, that this or that thinking. And we know that there's more choices and more possible things. Because there's always, really the problem is usually there's too many options, too many things we could do. Uh, and we want to narrow that down. We'll narrow that down tomorrow when we talk about the A, which we analyze and take action. Uh, but today we came up, I came up, I haven't done it yet, but we're going to brainstorm 10 different options and we're going to circle three. And then tomorrow we're going to analyze those three. <coughs> and I'm working on implementation of a new software program in my businesses. And one of the first things I've had to do is, is simplify and say, okay, what are the things I have to do first, second, third, and minimize the chaos of implementing this new software. And it's a big project, right? Big projects need to be broken down into little bite-sized pieces. And sometimes we need to ask for help. So I will I will write down my next steps options today as part of our annual challenge action item homework because I do it right along with you. I don't want to say, oh, you should do this, and then I don't do it. Have I written down my lessons learned from the pandemic? You bet I have. I've actually shared them on video on a several occasions. And guess what? Every day I think of something else that I've learned from that particular experience as we as we always should be looking for ways to improve and, and have uh, realizations and aha moments of, of, oh, that's how this all fit together. All right, that's all I've got today. If I can help you anyway, ask. Otherwise, I will be with you tomorrow. And have an absolutely fabulous day. Bye.